All right, welcome everybody to the back of the ute. Um, this is Marjorie Joyce, uh, de Berg's wife, and she's also very into the breeding side of producing cattle. Uh, we're at South End still. Welcome, Marjorie. Thank you, Tamsin. Nice to have you. What is it um, that makes a good breeder? Well, you have to have good nutrition and you have to have the right breed for the country and um, everything here has to be productive if they don't wean a, a good sappy um, muscly calf each year then we cull them send them to the meatworks um, with us when we do wean we mostly sell the steers because this is a, a forestry block not softwood scrub soil or anything we can't successfully carry steers on to be japox in under two years so we still sell the weaner steers and if you don't have a really good, well-grown, sappy weaner steer, you won't get much money. So that's why it's really important to have cows that produce a good calf each year. And, and we always cull, you know, 25 to 30% of our heifers if they're, uh, we have purebred Santa Gertrudis. We're not a stud anymore, but I like just to have a pure cherry red beast so if something happens and the beast has a white underline, it has a star, white star on its forehead, I tell them too. Or if they're just not going to get in calf next year, you know, we litter mate, we put the, keep wiener bulls every year, like 20 or so, and then those wiener bulls, say the number ones this, this year, they go in with their sisters, their number one sisters, heifer, heifers, and if they're too small and they're not going to get to 330 by January, February, March when we've got the bulls in, then we sell them to someone who's going to you know, feed, feed lot them or create breeders themselves. So we, that's what we do every year. The rest, the cattle we send to Meatworks are basically only cull cows. We sometimes cull for age if we can see they're not going to successfully wean a calf next year. We'll sell them this year or if they've aborted a calf, or we occasionally had to pull a calf out of that cow, they're earmarked. Um, all our cattle have to be branded and they have to be earmarked. But when we need to colour beast, while well, she's still probably got a calf on her, we take the point out of one ear. And then when you're drafting them later on, once you've weaned, you can easily detect which ones have to go to meatworks. And it doesn't need a tag saying, you know, you had to pull a calf out of me or I miss carving or I was a naughty girl or I'm a leader of the pack in the wrong direction. <laughs> they just go because they've got that point out. I like... So can I just... Uh, so why, when we're talking about culling, why is it important, the whole genetic side, because you are breeding, what, why would you then take those ones out of the herd? The heifers or the, or the cows? The cows. Uh, well, I wouldn't want her to abort next year or not have a calf next year. There's a trait in there that I don't want to keep, you know, for long-term productivity. Um, you wouldn't want a cow that you pulled a calf out because next year she may not even have a calf or you might have to pull a calf again. If she had a, a daughter, a female, you might have to pull her calf. You're just making a huge workload for you, for yourself. Everything has to, you know, nothing is mollycoddled here. Yes, we have plenty of feed. We move them around to fresh paddocks. Um, when it's droughty and we want to keep a core breeder group, we feed cotton seed and M8 dew, and they have lick blocks all the time, sulphur blocks and salt and all of that. But um, we don't we don't run them through the yards and feed them specially or give them antibiotics in order to have a calf or wean a calf or something. Everything has to be uh, easy care and do it on their own steam. Yeah. Okay, so you, you can't get emotionally involved. What about the training when you are bringing them up into the corral area? I'm not sure what you call it. Um, and then they drink and what, what, what's behind that? That just is, is great to, to learn about. Well, you must have them out of the paddock and they're in there, you know, mother, daughter, mother, son group in the paddock 
But you're bringing them together and they get mixed up. The calves might be on this side of the mob, on that side of the mob. So once we get them to the yard and we might have to drive them, this is only a small property, but we might have to drive them maximum five k's. So by the time you get there, they're all, most of them are disjointed, mothers aren't with their calves. So you put them into the big yard and they then either have a drink, if it's been a hot, thirsty day and they haven't had a drink before they left the paddock, they go up to the trough, always got clean water in the trough, either from the river or a dam or a bore in drought time. And then they'll think about where's our calf and the calf will be thinking, where's mum, I'm thirsty. So we let them mother up and have a drink or whatever, and it only takes about a quarter of an hour normally. You'll hear a cow bellowing or a calf bellowing or 10 times over, <laughs> and then eventually there'll be silence. And meanwhile, we're having a cup of tea. <laughs> Even if it's 8 a.m., you know, in, in, in summertime, we get up at 4, 4.30, 5. Um, if it's going to be hot, we certainly get up at 4. It's in the daylight, go out and muster. So we could have those cattle in the yard by 7 a.m. But we still sit down and have a cup of tea while the cows mother up, that's important. And then we bring them up into smaller yards, draft them off branding or whatever we're doing or injecting with copper for our copper deficiency. And then they go back to the big yard and again they'll mother up before we take them to another paddock. If they've come in from a, a paddock, invariably we'll take them to another paddock because we like to move them around different paddocks about every two to three weeks. We're not cell grazers, but we call it spell grazing. Spell grazing, I love that, that's yeah. great. So we just spell those paddocks, and ideally, with the number of paddocks we have, you know, it's easily four or five months normally before they have to go back in, and by that time, they've got rid of the um, smell and whatever imprint from the cows that were in there. Yeah. And it could be a different mob that goes in there anyway. Yeah. Um, and the same with the camels we run female camel mobs with one bull and then we run all the males together, steers or bulls, and we move them around as well behind the cattle. We don't, don't mix them anymore. Okay. The cattle have learnt to eat the, the regrowth, um, you know, different trees and shrubs thanks to the camel. They transferred that bug out of the camel gut oh. to the cattle gut and um, you'll find them browsing a lot more. And when they get you know, nu nu nutrients and vitamins, minerals out of those different trees. So yeah, no, that is incredible that the camel's microbes in their gut has got <laughs> transferred to the cattle's gut. Yes. So that they through the water. And yeah, they're oh, drinking so the same the water. water. Yeah, mm. of course. Yeah, with the saliva. I've heard yes. about that before. Yeah. And, um, and so now that they're able to um, digest mm. what they couldn't before. Yes, yes. And also forage so that they realise that that is actually... Um, edible. Yes, good good for them. They, you know, if we were on mulga country, they would have automatically be, eat it, be eating the mulga. And of course, they just love lakina, and they can put on a kilo a day by eating lakina with other grasses. But as well as that, you know, they're now, well, probably at least another 20 or 25 trees and shrubs. And We've got oodles of timber on South End, so it's never going to, um, we're never going to be a treeless plain. Mm. We're, it's productive country, fertile country, and the trees are constantly growing. So the camels do kill some by their constant eating, yep. but um, the cows will never because they don't browse it as heavily as a camel would. Yep. Camels can reach up to the top of the tree, which is the growing shoot, yep. uh, and they eat down, whereas a cow will only trim it from the bottom because she can't reach the top of the tree. Yeah. And how much uh, percentage of your land is trees? Oh. Very roughly? oh, a good a good third. third. Okay. Mm. Yeah. We've got a lot of trees here. We've had our PMABs done and the guru that came to put that PMAB together said, you've got more trees here and you're more green than any greenie I've ever seen. And is that because of the grazing, keeps it active? Yes, um, but you know, we've always been ones for keeping trees. Trees are everything, you have to have trees, otherwise you'll have a desert. Mm. So we have to keep the trees, it makes it cooler, more productive, um, especially trees on tops of hills, 
we, we you just have to use, uh, leave those because they bring the minerals up out of the mountain. Yep. Goes up through the tree leaves, the tree the leaves fall, and then you've got fertilising happening all down the hill. Yeah. And if you do happen to get a dead beast for some reason, then you take it to the top of the hill and then the, the um, goodness out of that beast renders down and goes down the bottom of the hill. If you're feeding cattle, your molasses or, or cotton seed, you put it on top of a hill. And then the cows go up there and they shit and, and we up there and then that goes down the hill. Yeah, of course. You don't have it, yes, you don't have all that down in the water because yeah. it would go straight into the dam and um, <coughs> wouldn't do any good. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and so that lovely care and, and um, intuition, <coughs> you take that from producing y your cattle into the truck to the abattoir? Yes. Um, Every, we, we put a lot of time in into making sure that our cattle are quiet and we do all their mustering on, on quads and we have dogs that just herd them. They don't bite them, they just herd them. I even have three Dachshunds that come out with me as well as three other Border Collies. And if I didn't have those dogs, they'd just think, oh, well, we'll just wander this way and wander that way and they won't go to another paddock or to the yard. So the dogs are there just as herders to keep the mob going. So they're, they're quiet. When we get to wean the calves, they're quiet because they've followed the mothers who are quiet. And then they get onto a truck and you only, we only ever use or try to use the one trucky that we know is really careful with the, you know, it doesn't drive um, dangerously. And therefore we, we haven't had any bruising in our Meatworks cattle for 30 or 40 years. There's just never a bruise. I've never even thought or heard about the whole bruising side of it. So you always use, you know, a good operator that doesn't have accidents and there's no bruising at, you know, they arrive at the Meatworks in cool, calm state, no bruising. So they're rested overnight and then they're killed the next day. Unfortunately, these days we can't, we're not really allowed to go and see them being killed, which is very annoying. Um, but we do uh, peruse the kill sheets and if there's some problem in there, we would be straight onto the Meatworks and asking why. Yeah. It's not ideal, I would love to go to see my cattle killed. We used to always do that when we were using the meatworks at Mergen. We'd followed down the next morning, we'd be there as they went up the ramp to be killed. We'd follow them around through then to the um, uh, weighing and, and uh, measuring guy, have a yarn with the management and the staff and then come home. And um, there was never any, any problem. We don't have disease cattle. Um, there could be maybe a dingo a bitten one where they might just have a notation that there was a dingo bite, dingo bite and they cut it out and we lost a couple of kgs, but that's a pretty rare thing because um, the cows are pretty good mothers and they protect their calves. We don't, we always dehorn because that stops bruising, but um, the cows are good mothers and keep the odd dingo away from them. So, we might get one, on average, one calf bitten per year, but that's about it. Um, we do we do keep an eye on the dingo and cat problems. Well, thank you so much, Marjorie. It's been an absolute pleasure, and thank you for having us and staying over, and I'm hoping that we can go and have a look around. All right, thank you, Tamsin. Thank you.